Hello, George here, and in this final video, we're going to discuss what was necessary to make Unity function properly. Uh, right now, I have opened the final scene, and of primary importance in this scene are two scripts that we're going to end up using. The first is the Bone script, followed by the Bone manager, and we're going to go through each of those uh, scripts, figure out exactly how they work and how we decided to program them. We're also going to cover importing in the Get Real plugin, uh, if you have access to that, utilizing some of the basic functionality inside of it to gather input data from a sensor, including position and orientation. All right, so I already have the project open, but I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the two scripts uh, so we start fresh, and I'm also going to show you what it would be like. So I already have Get Real 3D package loaded, and I know because I have this menu up here indicating as such. Now, if you were, if you have the Get Real package as well, and you're following along, what you would like to do is go to Import Package, Custom Package, and uh, the Get Real package itself should have been installed in your Mechdyne folder. So this is a 64-bit installation. So if you go to your Program Files, Mechdyne, Get Real 3D for Unity 3 and then for Unity projects, you'll have a plugin right here. In a few moments, the plugin window will pop up indicating all of the assets you're going to bring in. And of course, I'm going to hit cancel, but you should, of course, not do that. You should, uh, you should hit import instead. And then you'll have a folder inside of your project directory called Get Real 3D. And there are a few things actually in here that are very important. Um, one of them is under the, let's see, um, the resources section is the editor config. The editor config allows you to actually set up your own configuration file as if you were running in your VR system. And what you'll notice is right here, I've already labeled my trackers, my mapping trackers here. But if I was to run this on my VR system from the editor, it would be able to intercept that tracker data and use it within uh, a running version of the game inside the editor. And also of, of particular importance here is the name. So this is actually how we set up sensor data coming into the program. We map a tracker to a particular index. We specify the name that we're going to use. And within Unity, when we attempt to access the uh, sensor information, we are going to use these names. All right? So let's go ahead and close that really quick and get out of there. So uh, now let's actually get to making these scripts. So I went ahead and destroyed the, the two. Now I do have my scene already set up over here. We'll notice that I have my, uh, my final version of the dinosaurs, uh, main camera with nothing special on it at all. The only thing that you require with the Get Real plugin is that either you use one of their existing cameras or in my particular case, I almost never use their, their basic cameras. I instead take the camera I plan on using and attach to it the Get Real Camera Updater script. If you do not have this attached and you attempt to use a Get Real um, built game, it will crash without this. So that has to be there. That's what sets up all the camera information and updates the position and rotation based upon incoming data and information. Uh, the last thing I have right now is an empty bone manager, which is just a game object. That's where I will attach my bone manager script. You can see here it's yelling at me saying it can't find it because I deleted it. So let's go ahead and begin with the script. So create C sharp script, and we're going to call this just bone. Double click to launch mono develop. And let's talk a few, uh, for a moment about what we actually want this script to do. So the idea is I want the ability to attach, well, as I was coding this, and uh, you know, for future reference too, um, I wasn't sure what bones I was going to be using. I didn't want to make a, a, an arm bone or a leg bone or anything like that. I wanted a more generic class where I could attach this to any bone I saw fit and then just have it miraculously work. And what do I mean by work? Well, there's two features I want the bones to have. The first feature is it will take the object that it's attached to and move it around based upon sensor data in the cave. That is, a child will pick up one of the skulls, move it around in the cave, and I want the position of that object to match wherever that child is moving with that object, as well as the orientation. The second thing I wanted was uh, to give some visual feedback to the user. I wanted the transparency of the uh, bone itself, the virtual one inside the cave, to be um, less opaque the further away you are from where it should snap and becoming very, very, very opaque right when you get right on top of the object, okay? 
So let's, and then a few other small features, of course, was just to play an audio clip whenever the bone actually latches into the right position. Um, um, I think that's actually about it. Um, oh, and also inside the inspector, be able to set the sensor name up for any of the bones just with a simple string. Uh, those sensor names were the ones we saw before, you know, jaw, head, and so forth in that config file. And then, of course, be able to specify a snap distance so that we could tweak how far away the object would snap in, because sometimes it's a little difficult for someone to find the right pivot, so we want to give them a little bit of a sort of a, a window of opportunity. And then finally, adjust the fade distance, which is how far off it'll actually fade. Um, and uh, pretty much that's it. That's all the functionality the bones are going to have. Now, the bone manager is really just meant to keep track of how many bones you end up uh, snapping on, seeing if they're all snapped, and then, you know, kind of alerting the user that, hey, you've won, wonderful job, congrats, once all the bones are in their proper location. So let's go ahead and begin with the bone itself. Uh, so let's create a few variables. So I have an audio clip I'm going to want to eventually attach to this. So let's do public, oops, public audio clip. And that's just going to be bone clip. Uh, for right now, it's a temporary sound effect from Diablo 2 of, uh, I believe it was the skull gem, and it's not a gem, but the skull falling to the ground. It's like a sound, so to speak. So we're going to need that. And it's public, so I can just attach it in the inspector. Uh, next up, I'm going to want to store the original locations of the uh, object. So I'm just going to say origin location uh, vector 3, so that's the position information. I'm going to do a quaternion, which is how we store rotations. I'm just going to call that original uh, orientation. I do tend to like writing long names out just so that I know exactly what the heck I'm doing a few months from now. Now, the next thing I wanted to do was actually provide a serialized field, which means that I cannot modify this in the inspector, but it still pops up providing me information. And I wanted to make a bool value, and that's going to be called tracking. And at first, it's going to be set to false. The idea is I'm going to stop tracking the object as soon as it you know, uh, it comes in contact with the place it's supposed to be, and it'll just snap right there into the proper place, and then tracking will be turned off from there on out. And then finally, just a few more public variables. I'm going to do a public string sensor name. That's the name of the sensor this object is going to be looking for, so it knows where to move itself. I'm going to do snap distance, which is going to be uh, set to, let's see, 0.1 to start, which is pretty good. That's 0.1 meters then public, and then float, and fade, fade, fade distance. Perfect. And we're going to set that to just be equal to 1.0f for the moment, although I believe I end up using around a factor of 2 later on. And uh, uh, we're going to wait on this next part uh, just because this was something I added in hindsight, but I also wanted a reference to the bone manager. Now, the no bone manager exists at the moment, so that's going to give me an error. But I'm going to go ahead and type that in. And you'll see why I do this soon. Um, after I'm finished with this and I get into the manager, I wanted a way for the manager to sort of disseminate itself to all the bones so the bones can call a special function in bone manager whenever uh, you know, the user actually snaps something in the right location. Okay, so uh, we have, uh, let's see, void start. I'm actually not going to use start. As you know, start only occurs when the object becomes active. I want to use awake, so it doesn't matter if this object is active or not. First thing I need to do is I need to store that original location. So let's do original location is equal to uh, transform dot position. And let's do original uh, orientation is equal to transform dot uh, rotation. Okay, so now I have the original location stored. I don't need to worry about you, uh, losing them as I move the object around the scene. Next up, I'm going to set tracking equal to true so that we are actually tracking this object and we'll be doing updates. And um, let's see, I'm also going to give this object a tag. I'm going to give this object the tag bone. Tag is equal to bone. Now, we will have to go back into Unity now and add that as one of our tags. To do this, we're going to go over into Unity, Project Settings, Tags and Layers. And inside of our Tags field, now I'll already have this, but you'll need to add, hit the plus key, and then add your new bone, okay? Or your bone tag. The reason we're going to do this is it's going to make it so that the uh, game manager, excuse me, the bone manager later on can just query at the start of the entire thing in, in awake all of the bones, bring them in, and then it has access to them, and then it's going to actually pass itself to all of the bones later on uh, so the bones can call the bone manager when certain criteria have been met.
Okay, so let's moving on. Uh, let's move on. Moving on. Uh, the next thing I want to do is actually do the update function. So let's go ahead to that. Update's going to be really easy. We're just going to do a test if tracking. Whoops. If tracking. What do we want to do? Well, if we're tracking, we're going to want to do two things. We're going to want to update the sensor's location, and we're also going to want to check the distance we are from the sensor itself. So to do that, we're going to make two functions. One of them is going to be called map to sensor, and the other one is going to be called check distance. All right? So let's write these two functions really quick. Let's do void map to sensor. And the next one we're going to do is void check distance. OK? I keep doing that. All right, so map to sensor is an easy one. All maps to, map to sensor is going to do is it's going to take our current, uh, the trans, our current transforms position and orientation and make sure they're equal to whatever the sensor values actually are. So we're going to do transform dot position is equal to, uh, and this is where we're going to start using that get real plugin. So we're going to type get real 3D dot input dot get sensor. Okay. Now in get sensor, we need to pass in the sensor name. Normally you would just provide a string of whatever it is you want to, or I'd say jaw or head, so forth and so on. But instead, uh, the user's already specified what sensor they want. Remember, we're trying to make this generic, so we're just going to use sensor name. We're going to do dot position. We're going to do the same thing down here, except now we're going to do it for the orientation. Transform dot orient. Uh, you learn how to spell things. Transform dot uh, rotation. Excuse me. Transform dot rotation is equal to get real 3d dot input dot get sensor and we're going to do the sensor name again and now we're just going to do rotation as well so we're store we're we're replacing our position and our rotation with that information that we need okay next up what we need to do is write the check distance function so now that we've moved the object to the right location we need to make sure that that object is near well whether or not it's nearby the place it's supposed to snap and if it is near that place, we need to turn off tracking and put it back at the original origin, okay? So the way we're gonna do this is really simple. We're just gonna do some distance checks. We're gonna do a vector three. Uh, let's see, uh, position difference is going to be equal to what? So if you have two points, if you subtract point A from point B, what you end up with is uh, a vector going from A to B. So let's do, uh, let's see, original location minus the transform dot position. So this will make a vector going from transform dot position to or original location. Next up, we just need to know the magnitude of that. Float uh, distance is equal to position vector dot magnitude. Okay. Ne so so long as our magnitude is within that range, we should be good. The next thing we want to do is actually uh, set up the transparency settings for this object as well. So what I'm going to do is create a new color. Now, you can't directly set the alpha. You actually have to create an entire new color object in Unity, which is probably, excuse me here, I want to do um, uh, game object dot renderer dot. I need to grab the renderer, excuse me. So let's grab the renderer really quick. So let's do a uh, renderer um, rend right up here, and what I want to do is on awake, I want to grab that object. I want to grab that component so I'm not wasting precious time. Rend is going to be equal to uh, uh, what is it? get components, and then the kind of component I'm going to want to get is the renderer itself. Now you could wrap this in a check to make sure that you actually get this object, but I'm pretty sure I'm always going to have a renderer on this object, so I'm not going to bother with it. So the next thing we want to do is, of course, Let's see, move on down. Let's go to color. Color is going to equal the uh, renderer rend dot uh, material dot color. Okay, so we're storing the color value that we currently have. We're going to now set color equal to a new color. And this new color is going to be the uh, alpha, what the color dot the red, excuse me, color dot r color.g, color.b, so we're storing the RGB value. The only thing we want to change is the um, alpha value. We want to get that lower and lower and lower. And what I'm going to do basically is do a clamp on this thing. I'm going to take the uh, fade distance 
I'm going to subtract from that the actual distance. So that fade distance is how far out I want to be. The distance is how far out I actually am. And I'm going to clamp that between a range. I'm going to clamp that between 0, 0.0 and, of course, uh, 1.0, which is the max and the min. Now, actually, I want to kind of always make this a little bit visible in the scene. So I'm going to do a, a value of 0 0.1 and a value of 1.0 uh, range between it. That way it's always visible in the scene at some, at some point. So the next thing I need to do is now that I've set all this stuff up, well, first of all, let's do the render, let's see, renderer, rend dot, forgot I call it rend dot material dot color is equal to this color value now. So we're constantly updating the color. The next part is to do actually do the distance check. So if distance is less than the snap distance, if we're within that range, what we're going to end up doing now is we're just going to call a function I'm going to call snap, a new function. Yay. Whoops, I hate when you... Let's just write the function so it actually auto-completes for me. Let's do void snap. There we go. So let's do snap. And all that snap is going to end up doing is attaching us to the other location. Okay? So let's go up there and finish snap. So with snap, if we're tracking... If we're tracking, what are we going to do? We are going to take the transform.position and set it equal to the original location. We're going to take transform.rotation. We're going to set that equal to the original orientation in this particular case. And then we're going to set tracking equal to false. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is, let's see, uh, we want to do this dot enabled is equal to false. I, I'm just going to turn the script off. I, I, there's no real reason to have the script on. Technically, I don't even need to do tracking in that particular case, but hey, I'm just uh, beating the dead horse at this point. So let's do audio source dot play clip at point. And I'm going to play that bone snapping sound that we had put up here at the top. So if I scroll up, what would I call that? Bone clip. So we're going to call it bone clip. Bone clip. And then what I'm going to do, the position I'm going to place this at, so I can put it anywhere I want to, but I want it to actually really be heard. Um, do I want it to be heard at the, let's see, should I have it? I'm going to have it be heard at the location uh, of the object itself. So we should just need to put transform.position in this case. So that you'll hear the snapping where it actually snaps into place. Okay, so that's pretty much it. The next thing we're going to do now is create the bone manager. So let's, let's uh, move back here, create a new script, file, create. C sharp script, bone manager. Double click it, bring it up in mono develop. And now that we have the bone manager up, uh, we're going to jump back and forth between these two a little bit um, because I need to go back and make some changes that didn't make sense until the bone manager actually existed. But what I want to do in the bone manager is, well, first of all, I need all my bones. I need to know what the heck I'm dealing with. I have no concept of how many bones are in the scene. So we're going to create an array just called game object bones. We're going to also um, we need a few protected fields. We need to know how many bones have actually been placed, which we're going to set to be zero at the start of the game. We also need to know the uh, number of bones in the game, because that could be variable. There's nothing saying I couldn't add 10 or 20 or a million more bones in the future. Not that I will be. The next thing I want to do is add two audio clips. I want to add an audio clip called Fanfare, which is going to be what you play at the end. And I want to add an audio clip that's called Narration, which is something I actually just recently added. It's me kind of giving the kids an overview of what they're supposed to be doing. So once again, we need to start in, uh, let's just start and start. So uh, start typically will happen after awake, most likely. So in this particular case, I'm going to do a query I'm going to do bones is equal to game object dot find game objects with tag. So I'm going to get an array of objects, and the tag, of course, if you've been paying attention, is going to be bone. The next thing I need to do is now that I've grabbed all my bones, I want to know, I want to store the number of bones. So number of bones is equal to bones dot length. Excuse my typing, I'm using a keyboard that I don't particularly love. My uh, laptop had an unfortunate accident with uh, a bottle of soda recently. So I have to use a different keyboard for everything. So what I'm gonna be doing right now is iterating. I'm using a for each loop. I'm gonna iterate over every game object and I want, uh, I, I'm gonna be getting every game object that was stored in the bones array. I'm gonna do gm.getComponent. That component is going to be the bone. 
And I want to call a function that doesn't exist yet, and I got to go write it. But it's going to be called set manager. And what this function is going to do is just going to go into each bone and set it to be itself. Yes, there are other ways of doing this. The, each bone could have tried to find the manager if I wanted to, and so forth and so on. I just happen to do it this way. The last thing I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to do, uh, a, I'm going to make a function call to invoke. What invoke is going to do is it's going to call a function that I'll write in just a second called play narration. Play narration, uh, I'm using invoke uh, because it's an easy way to do a one-shot function. I can specify the delay of this as well. And it, it, um, basically it's just a way for me to start the narration at a delayed set. Why do I need to do this? The cave itself typically takes a few seconds to start up. And if the narration begins right at the start, the audio will actually play before I have any scenes up. So I need to delay that so the kids aren't you know, distracted by the audio before anything is even on the screens. So the next thing though that I did was I added the, I called the bones function called set manager. I don't have that function, so I actually need to go back and write that in. So set manager is really easy. All it's going to do, we're going to come back in here, uncomment that protected bone manager line. And now we're going to write a new function. It needs to be public so the other ones can find it. It's going to be called set manager. Jeez, that is going to be, that is, oh, that is the, uh, the backspace keys right next to the darn uh, insert key, which is kind of messing me up as well. We're going to pass the bone manager in BM, and I'm just going to store it. So bone manager is going to equal to BM. So now all the bones have access to the bone manager. Now the bone manager, the next, sta next phase for the bone manager is going to end up being the, let's see, we've done start. We're all done with that. So let's do the narration part. So let's do void play narration. And all this is going to do is once again do audio source dot play clip at point so we can play it, uh, a clip at a specific 3D location. I'm going to do narration. That's the clip. And then I'm going to do get real 3D dot input dot get sensor. And inside of there I'm going to put head. Now that is head tracking. So wherever the, the player's head is basically being tracked by the system. Uh, so when they put on their 3D glasses, there's a head tracking unit that goes, that is attached to it. This way I know the audio source is also attached to the head roughly at the camera's location. So I know I'm playing the narration at the head, which means it's going to be very loud. And I don't have to fiddle around with mono sounds and so forth, which I was trying to do earlier. And I just didn't quite get the, um, the level of audio I wanted to, even after tweaking the sound clip. So this is just an easy way, so I'm certain we're playing at 100% intensity at the player's location. Okay? So that's start. The last function we need to deal with is actually update. So all update is going to do is uh, pretty much check to see, uh, well, actually, hold on. I'm wrong. Update does absolutely nothing. That's right, I forgot. I wanted to make this script clean. I did not want to use update. I did not want to constantly query these bones saying, hey, are you done yet? Did you snap? Are you finished? Instead, I made a function called bone placed. And this is the entire reason I uh, pass the game manager to each one of the bones. Um, what we can do here is do game object. Uh, it's gonna take in a game object called bone. So each bone, when it's been snapped into place, will call this function on the bone manager. This function will then tell the bone manager that a bone has been placed, increment, increment the number of placed bones, check to see if we've hit the max cap, and if we had, play a victory tune. So let's go ahead and do that. So uh, place bones plus plus, and let's do an if check if place bones is equal to the number of bones. Then we're going to do audio source. Oops. Source dot play clip at point. And we are going to play the fanfare, which can be any music you want. Game object dot transform dot. Uh, that's going to play it at the location of the bone manager, which is not what we want. Let's do it at the position of the player's head again. So get real 3D dot input dot uh, get sensor head and let's do dot position. So long as that's a vector three, that'll work just fine. Okay, now we just have to make one little quick change to our bone script. We're gonna jump on back and we're going to add the call um, when we actually snap onto the object to call the game manager, excuse me, the bone manager and tell it, hey, we snapped, increment everything. So we're just gonna call bone manager dot 
bone placed, and then we'll do this dot game object. All right. So we pass ourselves, or excuse, excuse me, we pass the game object itself in to be used. Okay. Now that's pretty much it. Uh, there's really nothing else we need to do in this particular case. Let me see if these errors have anything to do with what I've been typing. Yes, the best overloaded method is float, float, float. So apparently I made a couple mistakes. So let's see if we can't find this. Math.clamp is equal to float of oh, F. Uh, that's always a problem. It will not down convert from double. Let's get rid of that clear. Hey, and there we are. And now the last thing we have to do is attach our scripts to the objects we care about. So I'm going to come over to my uh, dinosaur. I'm going to click on one of the bone segments. I'm just going to go to add component. You can see it tried to right there. Why don't we just go ahead and nuke that really quick. Remove, add component, bone, bam. And uh, in this case, we have to attach our audio clip. I recommend waiting. Uh, go in, let's, do, let's just do two for example. Let's add two bones in here, one to the jaw and one to the head. And uh, let's do sensor name. We're going to call this one jaw. We're going to call this one head. And, uh, no, um, skull. Head is something completely different. Uh, I'm going to do a now a look for all bone objects. So it filters everything out, finds them by component, select these top two. And since they share the same component over here in the inspector, I can edit them together. So I can do something like make the fade distance larger or for that matter, find my fanfare music and add it right there. Now, the other thing I need to do is, of course, add my bone manager to the scene. So let's just type bone manager, add that in right there. I need to add my fanfare and my narration to it. So let's do skeleton intro. And then, of course, uh, the fanfare music right there. Actually, I messed that up. Bone, I don't want to add fanfare to that. I want to add the skull clip. There we go, perfect. So now um, that should be perfect. You know, everything should work. Uh, we can test to make sure things are going on. Oh, that's my uh, narration playing. But that's, that's pretty much it. That's everything for this project. Incredibly simple, not a whole lot uh, necessary. Uh, there was one thing I left out, and that is the depth test shader. So this skeleton itself, the materials on it, if I go to the bones, will notice I have a standard shader on this object, which is incorrect. I actually want to use one of the newer shaders. So let's find, um, blah, 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 blah. I think it's under, was it legacy? And where did this thing go? It's, it's the, let's see, let's open the shader up. So if you go to Unity's website, they actually, in the transparency section, give you this shader. You don't have to write this yourself. You don't have to worry about understanding. So it's under shader, transparent, diffuse, Z right is what I want. Copy and paste this into a new shader in there. And what this does is actually does Z testing, which means that you, it writes to the Z buffer basically so that you won't have uh, a lot of artifacts with, with rendering. Uh, you'll have a lot of problems with transparency. The, the back will be rendered before the front and it'll look kind of nasty. This gets rid of those problems. Just realize that you won't see the back and the front of objects. You'll just see the side facing towards you. All right, but this works perfect for fading things in and out. So I need to do transparent, diffuse, see right. So let's do that really quick. Grab the object, find that. Let's see, standard, uh, I need transparent, diffuse, see right. And that is literally everything. Now everything's set up just fine. No problems in the scene. Go to file, build settings, and then go ahead and build your scene out. Save it where you'd like to. And uh, why don't we see if we can do a quick video of it running in the cave. Over the course of millions of years, the remains of dinosaurs were transformed into fossils. Here we have two nearly complete Tyrannosaurus rex skeletons, but a few pieces are missing. Pick the fossils on the table up and try to figure out where they go. Look to the other T-Rex to see what might be missing. 